Our text this week is from the book of Zechariah, chapter 10, the latter rain. And in the very first verse, it speaks about this. Verse 1, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain, and the Lord will make flashing clouds, and he will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. And so it mentions this phrase, this latter rain. It's mentioned a few times in the Bible. Uh, in Deuteronomy, it talks about uh, an early rain and a latter rain having to do with the harvest. In Israel, it rains, really just has a rainy season. Uh, it starts to begin to rain October, November or so, and it will rain uh, through that time, through the winter time, uh, and then basically ends at around March. And so that is the main growing season. Planting begins in the fall uh, for the spring harvest, right? So we've done that here after Passover, the counting of the Omer, the beginning of the harvesting uh, from right the third day after Passover, the wave sheath offering uh, to the Shavuot, uh, 50 days later, when the harvesting is done. And we have the Book of Ruth that takes place during that time. So that we need this beginning rain, this early rain in the fall to begin to germinate the seed, to get the seed start uh, planting growing roots and begin to grow and then through the winter it continues to grow and then it needs a ending rain to ripen the grain to bring it to full um, height and to full ripeness so that it can be harvested and if it's missing any aspect of that if it doesn't get a good fall rain to get it started well then of course you're not going to have any ending crop uh, but if it gets a good fall rain and it starts and it starts off well and it starts growing and gets some rain through through the winter months, then it'll be doing good. But if it doesn't get that fall, that spring rain, that latter rain to just finish it off, then you might not have any crop or very weak crop. And then through the rest of the, the time in Israel, it basically doesn't hardly rain at all. So it rains during that time and basically only during that time. So it needs both the early rain and the latter rain. And so they would pray for that, and they would be, um, even now during uh, Sukkot, um, one of the things to do is to pray for the rainy season to come and be a blessing, especially, I mean, now we have irrigation in many parts of the world, in Israel and other parts of the world, but uh, so you can get water out of, the, out of the ground and suck it up, but certainly in ancient times, up until fairly recently in historical times, uh, rain was what we were depending on, and farmers were very dependent on it. And so prayer for rain was an ongoing yearly ritual and necessity. It was a tough work, and it still is. And they work hard. And so God's telling us to pray for the Lord, ask the Lord, that we need to ask him for it, to pray for it, for the latter rain. Now since it's in the book of Zechariah, when it's talking about it in Deuteronomy, it's talking about literal rain and literal harvest and some other places in the Bible. Um, but some of the places it's talking symbolically, and certainly here in Zechariah, a prophetic book, uh, it's talking about the symbolism of this final rain to bring the fruit to its fruition. We have a few analogies that that fits into. We have the beginning of the work during this Messianic age where God started the work at that Passover 2,000 years ago, and and then uh, that night was killed and then rested in the grave and then rose as that first fruit and then remained and continued to bless his disciples through that time of between the wave sheath offering and Shavuot and then poured out his spirit upon his disciples in that like kind of first rain, that early rain that empowered them miraculously to be able to minister beyond their human capabilities and beyond what they had been doing before. And God had been using them to minister before, but at that point, to really just start the work off, 3,000 people were immersed in the Lord, came to the Lord as a result of that outpouring of God's Spirit. And then shortly thereafter, in Jerusalem, Jewish people, 5,000 came to the Lord, and then every day people were coming to the Lord. I know of no other city in ancient times in the Bible mentioned where that many people come to the Lord in one day. And that masses. Good 25% of the Jewish people living in and around Jerusalem became believers. 
as a result of that, that rain beginning the crop and getting it going and getting God's work spreading. Today, 2,000 years later, or over 2,000 years since Zechariah wrote, and over 3,000 years since Moses wrote, close to 4,000 years since Abraham's time, I've had all this time, and yet today, I can pretty much guarantee you, in this area and surrounding area, in this nation, with Bibles in hotels and Bibles in lots of stores available to us, Bibles available for free, downloadable onto your phone, we won't have this weekend 25% of this population in our area attend any service, whether it's our service or some other service or a Christian service or a Catholic service or or the Polish American Club, or whatever. 25% will not be attending a religious service or even a, you know, some type of service um, or non-service. 25%. So to have 25% of the population in and around Jerusalem, especially when you had most of the leaders persecuting those that are believers, to believe and to stay fast and to openly profess at that time, and in that number, that's an amazing number. God's Spirit was poured out. And the work began with a great push. And then from there, began to spread to the then known world. Rapidly. Within about 100 years, or less than that, really within about 70 years. Spread to the then known world. Going from city to city. The gospel being preached and people coming to the Lord. And now at the end of time, the end of earth's history, as we come towards the symbolic fall feast, the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the final day of judgment, the end of time, we're needing another outpouring of God's Spirit. We're needing God's power to come upon us, to give us victory over sins. And as the Holy Spirit was poured out the first time, wasn't for their benefit, wasn't for feel good. It was so that they could witness. It was so that they could tell other people about the Lord. And so that they could share God's truth to others in ways that the other people would be able to receive it and hear it and understand it. And so today we are needing an outpouring of God's Spirit for this work to finish off. And I believe God will finish his work off greater and greater power than he began his work. And as thousands came to the Lord in a day, again we will see thousands come to the Lord. Tens of thousands of people come to the Lord in great number and even among persecution. And it might be the persecution that brings it about. Because for the most part, I think we're sleeping. We're needing God's Spirit to be poured out upon us. And then another analogy is in our own lives. We come to the Lord and we have, most often everyone has a little different experience. But when we first come to the Lord, there's, there's a joy that takes place. When we come to know the Creator God, and not just on a knowing, knowledgeable level that we can read it in a book, that we can be told about it, but when we know it internally, when we fall in love with him, when we accept that he loves us, that he is a living being, and that he's forgiven us our sins and our guilt is removed and this weight lifts off our shoulders, there's an immense joy that comes and a devotion and a love for God that springs up that wasn't there before. We might have heard of God all our lives or for a long time, but when we have that real experience with Him, we fall in love with Him. And then in falling in love with God, we fall in love with others. And it changes us radically. Again, everyone has a little different experience, but there are factors there. A thanking of God, a confession of sin, a releasing of guilt, a deliverance, a victory over sins, and a love for God, 
and a love for others. Those things are there, those elements are there in everyone who comes to know the Lord. In different ways it manifests itself, but everyone has to have that experience. That's the experience when we come in contact with the Lord. When we experience that first rain, when we experience that early rain in our personal lives, we love God. We love his word. We're thankful for it. We've been released of sin. And victory over sins and love for others. I remember when it happened to me. I gave my heart to the Lord and I just fell in love with Him. And then I had love for people beyond what I had before. And I went around, I was about 17 or 18, and I went around telling my friends how much I loved them. And they all stepped back. <laughs> you know, I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, secular school and secular people. And, Worldly, they had no idea. They couldn't fathom it. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't relate to it at all. God gave me a love. And I just had to share it. I just had to tell other people about him for their benefit. To meet the God that I'd fallen in love with. So we have that experience. That first love, the Bible says, and Regarding, in Revelation, regarding one of the congregations, says, you lost your first love. We have this first love experience. And then we go along and we grow and we grow and we grow. And kind of like in, in our humanity, we have growth spurts, and then we kind of level off for a while. So we grow, but we should be growing as believers. On a steady, sometimes up, sometimes downs. But there should be growth. But in the last, the end, we need an outpouring of God's Spirit, a special outpouring upon us that gives us the ability to stand through a time of trouble such as the world has never seen, such as it gives us the ability to be able to face the devil while the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from this earth, be able to face the pressures that Satan will place upon us, that we've never experienced before. The power to resist sin. The power to witness in a dark age. Under persecution, under trial, while being rejected. And to stand for the right. And to ripen the grain. To perfect the grain. So that we demonstrate God's love back in his image. Recreated in his image. Because we're not born in his image. Adam and Eve were created in God's image. But if, if you weren't familiar with it, you weren't. You're not in God's image. We're not created naturally in God's image. I'm not, wasn't created, wasn't born in God's image. Adam and Eve were. But you and I weren't. And I can prove that to you. It's pretty simple. Just look in the mirror. <laughs> look at our lives. Is that the character of God? Throughout our lives, has that been the character of God? No, we've taken on a carnal nature. We've taken on a nature that is enmity against God, that is resistant to God, that doesn't love him. It's not natural for us to love God. Thus, we need to be born again. We need to be born anew. We need to accept the Messiah's sacrifice in our behalf. And just as that seed, in order for that rain to germinate that seed and get it going, that seed has to come off the tree. Can't be attached to the tree anymore. Separated from its life. Separated from its life source. And buried in the ground. Under dirt. It has to die in order to be able to live. And we also need to be buried in baptism to the Lord, in the Lord dead to sin, have self-crucified, have our natural carnal nature killed in the Lord. In accepting his death, we died with him. And then on a daily basis, as the carnal nature tries to creep back in, re-surrendering every single day so that there can be that growth and then we continue to grow. But at the end, we need this bringing it forth to ripening. 
fertilizing it, reading God's word, praying, strengthening the tree so that the fruit can ripen up. We have a couple orange trees in our backyard, and if we don't remember to throw some fertilizer down in the summer, if we let the weeds grow up around it, it can have nice fruit on it. It can have nice fruit all year long, all season long. But then as it gets close to the end, when it's needing that extra energy and the tree is needing to send that extra energy into that fruit to ripen it up, they just drop off. One after another, they just start dropping off because it doesn't have that extra nutrients at that time. And the weeds are sucking away the, any nutrients that are in the ground. That's why it needs to be tilled. It needs to be weeded. It needs to be fertilized. We need that latter rain. We need God's spirit. We need to be in his word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be united together, coming together and receiving as a family of God together, the word of God together. And receiving it, not just hearing it, but receiving it. There were people among the disciples when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Judas was among the disciples. Other people were there in around the upper room when the Holy Spirit was poured out. But if we don't have open hearts to receive it, people all around us will receive it and we won't even know it. We can be in the right place. We can be reading the right book, saying the right prayers. But if our heart is not surrendered to God, if we have not experienced the death to self, we won't comprehend what they're talking about. We won't be able to understand the, the joy that passes understanding. The ability to receive forgiveness of sins. The ability to forgive others. The ability to have victory over sin. To be able to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. None of those things come naturally. They are divine, miraculous, given to us by God. If we don't have God, you can't understand that. You can't see how it could possibly be possible. And there's a great movement in the world today that is denying the ability to change. There's a strong push. You were born this way. This is how you are. Don't let anyone try and change you. There's even attempts, and in some countries, illegal to counsel somebody to change from how they think they were born. Because there's this denial of the ability to change. Because people who've never experienced God's power to change don't have the ability to change. They say, well, I don't have the ability to change, so you don't have the ability to change, so let's stop feeling guilty that we haven't changed, and let's just stay in our carnal nature. And whatever feels good, just do it. God gives us the power to change. So in the end, we need an extra pouring, outpouring of his spirit. That extra rain at the end to bring the fruit to full fruition so that we represent God, so we are recreated in his image, having victory over all sin. So the record books in heaven can be closed because God's people are no longer choosing to rebelliously resist God and turn against him. We need the outpouring of God's Spirit. We need to be praying for it. We need to sense our need of it. If we're just comfortable, we think we're okay, we're doing all right, we love the Lord, we had that first love experience, and we think we're okay, the fruit might look good, but it's going to drop off the tree before it gets ripened. We won't make it through the time of trouble. At that time, it will be too late to be praying for God's Spirit. That's the whole story of the, of, the, of the ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom. All ten were waiting for him. They were all believers. They had all read the Bible. They all knew he was coming. They were all anxiously waiting. They all had lamps. All their lamps were burning fine. But there was a delay in his coming. And they all fell asleep, all of them. 
all 10, 100% fell asleep. And today, 100%, we're all sleeping. And yet when the announcement came, the bridegroom cometh. Five had extra oil. They had prayed for it, they had sought it out, they had stored it up, they had brought it with them, and they were ready. They woke up, and they lit their lamps. They refilled their jars. They were able to relight their lamps. And the bridegroom came, and they went in with him. But the other five didn't have it. And they turned to the five that didn't and said, give us some of your oil, and the others were not able to. We can't get it from somebody else. And at that time, it'll be too late. Don't wait till the whole world is coming apart, and it's already coming apart. Don't wait to receive a newsletter. <laughs> the latter rain is coming down. Be praying. Ask the Lord for the rain in the time of the latter rain. And we are in the time of the latter rain. And we need God's Spirit. We need it outpoured in our lives. We need that perfecting of character in our lives. So that the world not only hears about him, but that the world sees him lived out in our lives. Totally and completely. And if that's hard for us, well, then we're trying to do it in our own strength. But if we let God do it in us, his spirit do it in us, he will give us victory in every area of our lives. Is it possible for you to go to work this week? Or if you're retired, think back when you were working. Would it be possible for you to go into work for a whole week, knowing your boss's expectations, to go into work, and to rebelliously do something that you knew he didn't want you to do, you knew was against the rules of the job and of the company and of your position, is it possible to go in and rebelliously do something that you know is just going to tick them off and get you fired? Is that possible? Could you do that? Yeah, it'd be pretty easy. Is it possible to go a whole week and not do something that you know is against the rules of the company that's going to tick off your boss and get you fired? Is that possible? Yeah, you do it every week, right? <laughs> and I'm sure there's lots of times you want to do something that will just tick off your boss or to be against the rules of the company. Right? But we do it. So if we can do that, certainly by God's Spirit and God's grace, we can go a whole week, a whole life, without doing anything that is rebelliously against what God has told us not to do. The difference is the, the devil's constantly helping us do what we shouldn't do. But God is more than a match. And much more grace abounds where sin abounds. And he's able to give us that perfecting of character with the outpouring of the latter rain. And that's what we need, and that's what we need to be praying for. God, fill us with your spirit. Complete your work in us. Not just going along with the ride for the ride. Not just hanging on to God's name and professing to follow him. But allowing him to transform us and change us. For the idols speak delusion. The diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. This is happening today. Idols are speaking delusions. Idols are speaking crazy things and deluding the people. Oh, we may not have little figurine idols. Oh, well, they've been very popular in all of history. Archaeologists and anthropologists find history and records of idols in almost, if not every single people group that has ever existed. But we have our own kind of idols. Our stuff is our idols, our things are our idols, our self is our idols. 
We've got Hollywood idols and sports idols, and they're certainly speaking lots of delusional, crazy stuff right now. And lots of people think there's something to listen to because they can throw a pigskin or run with it or pretend and act like there's somebody else very well. So that it should be listened to. I don't think so. I think the word of God is what needs to be listened to. Not those who deny the word of God. Diviners envision lies. There's lots of false spirits. There's lots of false teachers out there. There's lots of false religions and spirituality that's being sucked up to and listened to. Telling false dreams, false hopes, false future. A lot of lies. And the comfort that they give is in vain. It's empty promises, empty comfort. Whatever feels good, do it. That's not comforting. Because the Holy Spirit is being poured out and conviction still comes. We can deny it all we want. And the conviction is still there. And there's no comfort under conviction. We can deny it. We can pretend that it, our actions are okay when we know they're not okay. We can excuse them. Everyone else is doing it. It's vain comfort. We can try real hard. Comfort's in vain. Soothes the troubled heart slightly. Therefore, the people are wandering around like sheep. And we see that today. People are just wandering around with no guidance, no direction, rejecting the word of God, denying the word of God, don't know where they're going, don't know what our purpose is on life, don't know where we came from. I think we came from an amoeba to have no purpose in this life, and then to be good, or not even be good, but to do to, to, to have fun, to enjoy it here. I don't know why we're here. We don't know where we're going. But the word of God tells us where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. We have a good shepherd who has led the way, and who directs our path. But when we reject him, we just wander around as lost sheep. If you have a group of sheep and there's no shepherd, the shepherd goes for a hike, the sheep are just going to all wander around. They're all going to go in all different directions. They're going to go eat some grass here and eat some weeds here and some poison there and get eaten by a wolf there and just all wander and scatter. Get lost. People are going everywhere, thinking everything. No cohesiveness, no morality, no idea what is right, what is wrong. What was wrong yesterday is now right. What is wrong today will be right tomorrow. No concept. There's no basis for anything. No law, no order. Without law, without structure, there's no happiness. It's chaos. And they're in trouble because there is no shepherd. But we have a shepherd. And we have direction in the word of God. My anger is kindled against the shepherd, and I will punish the goat herds, for the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and make them as his royal horse in the battle. God will deal with the false shepherds. These shepherds who don't think that we are essential. We are essential. Believers are essential. A congregation is essential. Karen told me yesterday that she read that one in five congregations are closing up permanently. And I shouldn't be surprised. I mean, how many restaurants are closing up? Big stores are closing up with lots of money, lots of backing. Lots of stuff to sell, they're closing up. 
But we are essential. We cannot close up. The word of God needs to be spoken. The word of God needs to be preached. The word of God needs to be heard. Fellowshipping needs to take place. On the internet, it's helpful, but it's not the replacement. The Bible says, do not forsake gathering together, one another, coming together. But the world is trying to shut us down. The devil is trying to shut us down because he knows his time is short and he knows it's time for the latter rain. He knows it's time for the fruit to be picked and the harvest to take place. And he doesn't want that to happen. And the shepherds don't realize they are essential. We're sleeping. And the devil is on the march. We are on the verge of eternity. The last days are right upon us. And God calls his people. He visits his flock. He calls us together. He makes us a royal house, a royal horse in the battle. And he comes riding on his white horse. He comes riding into battle. Using his people to go forth victorious. Conquering. Not in their own strength, but him leading the way, directing the way, charging into battle, not afraid of the battle. And the gates of hell will not prevail against them. The gates are made in the enemy territory to keep prisoners in. And God calls us to go and knock down the gates and set the prisoners free. Not to hide behind our gates, but to go out and set people free. To go and liberate the captives. Going into battle. Seeking to save those that are lost. The Lord leading the way. In his strength and in his power. That is what he has called us to. We have a purpose. We are alive for a reason. He pours out his spirit for a reason. Again, not for some inward feeling. Not for some personal experience. But so that we can represent God to this world. And we can shine as light in this dark age. Thus our lamps need to be trimmed and burning for him. From him comes the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. They shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle, and they shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on the horses shall be put to shame. It's from the Lord that we have a foundation. It is the Lord who is our cornerstone. Yeshua is our chief cornerstone. We are built upon him. He is the rider on the horse. He is the, the, the good shepherd. From him we have our foundation to not be shaken, to not be moved, to not be shaken away, to not be knocked over, to not fall, to not sink but a strong foundation to stand upon. While the world is crumbling, we have a chief cornerstone to build upon. From him is the tent peg that holds the tent together as the winds blow upon it, as the storm comes upon it, as the tornadoes blow on it, the tent pegs are there securing the tent. We are secure in the Lord. From him comes the tent page. From him comes our foundation. From him comes our security. From him the battle bow. We have the weapons of our warfare because of him. They come from him. Not in our own strength, as Zechariah already told us in an earlier chapter. Not in our own might, not in our own strength, but in the might of the Lord. In his power, in his might, we go forth into battle with his weapons, of his warfare. Not our weapons, not weapons of arguments, not weapons of reason, 
but the weapon of the Word of God, the sword of God. The Spirit of God going forth as our weapon, as our bow. And from Him, every ruler together, united together, They will know we are believers because of our oneness together, because of our love for one another, for our concern for one another, united together, ruling together, marching together in his word, in his strength, in his truth. We will be mighty men and women for God. Going into battle, And our enemies are not the enemies of this world. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not against humans. Well, there's an attempt to make a war right now to get human against human. And we may very well see that. And we may very well be caught in the middle, hated by both sides. But our enemy is not people. Our enemy is sin. Our enemy is the devil. Our enemy is self, our enemy is temptation. And we will go forth in battle victorious. Gaining victory over appetite and over attitudes, over thoughts and over desires, over passions and over inclinations, over natural desires. He will give us the victory. He will send us forth into battle. And we will fight. We will fight against the devil. We will fight against the flesh because the Lord is with us. And we will win the battle by his grace, by his strength, because he is a mighty horseman. He never loses a battle. As we surrender our lives to him and are filled with his strength, we will win in him. I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have had mercy on them and they shall be as though they had not cast them aside for I am the Lord their God and I will hear them. He strengthens us and that's what we need that latter rain power for. We need that strength in these last days. And when we are weak, that's when we are strong. It's realizing our weakness, realizing our need, That's when we can be strengthened. When we think we're okay, we're in trouble. When we realize our desperate need of the Lord, totally, daily, dependent on Him, He will strengthen the house of Judah and He will save the house of Joseph. All together, He saves us. And it'll be as if we had not been cast aside. When Zechariah was writing this, We just spent 70 years in Babylon and then Medo-Persia. No city, no nation, Jerusalem destroyed, Judah and Israel captive. And Israel, Joseph, long before Judah, but he's promising, I will bring them back. At the time Zechariah wrote this, very few had come back. He's promising, I will bring them back. It'll be as if they had not been cast aside. I will hear them. Those of Ephraim, that's also Israel, shall be like the mighty men, and their hearts shall rejoice as if with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them, for I will redeem them, and they shall increase as they once increased. Again, in Zechariah's time to write this, to say this, it is unfathomable, it's impossible. You don't even have a full city yet. You don't even have walls still for another 60 years after this. Your temple isn't even fully built yet. You don't even have a nation yet. You don't even have an army yet. It's been 70, 70 years in exile and longer than that for Ephraim. Scattered. You're going to come back? Unheard of. It's not going to happen. But God promised it would happen. And God promised we would increase as we had once increased. And God was right. Surprise, surprise. 
He came through. We did come back. And in great numbers. And by the time of the Maccabees, there were great numbers and they were victorious. And by the time of Yeshua, the city was full and the nation was full. Miraculous. And today, God is gathering Judah and Ephraim as well back to Israel. He's gathering his children. Verse 9, I will sow them among the people and they shall remember me in far countries. They shall live together with their children and they shall return. I will also bring them back to the land from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no more room is found for them. Shall be, remember in the far countries we were scattered, they were Ephraim, Israel was scattered to far countries. Judah was scattered. 70 years in exile. Miraculously came back. And then after Yeshua's day, the temple destroyed again by the Romans this time. Scattered for almost 2,000 years to far one, faraway nations. Just as it says here. There's no other country, there's no other people that were apart from their nation for 2,000 years that came back as a nation. No one else. That's miraculous. That's absolutely, but the Bible said so. The Bible said, I will bring them back to where there's no room found for them. Israel's building up, they're building high rises to accommodate all the people. Starting to build in the desert to accommodate all the people. Miraculous. Absolutely miraculous. After six million were killed, was it something like one third of all the Jews in the world were killed? Absolutely miraculous. There's a small nation of Israel rebuilding and building up and filling up. But God promised it. God prophesied it. And it came to pass. It came to pass shortly after Zechariah, and it's coming to pass again. Early rain, and then these last days as well. And just as surely as we know that he did this, because we can see it, he fulfilled his promises, miraculously, impossibly, also he will send forth his spirit, miraculously and impossibly, and give us victory over sin. Give us his character. Give us his divine nature. And he will live in us and move us forth victoriously. He shall pass through the sea with affliction and strike the waves of the sea and all the depths of the river shall dry up and then the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. So I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk up and down in his name says the Lord. We've passed through the sea of affliction. Thousands of years of affliction. God has seen us through the sea. The waters have risen up, but they did not rise over us. He has protected us and sustained us through all the floods. Many martyrs, many deaths, but he has sustained his people. God's word remains. Hundreds of years of it being outlawed, and God's people remain. Hundreds of years of persecution and killings and God's people remain. It's miraculous. He has seen us through the sea of affliction and the striking of the waves of the sea. He has dried up the rivers. He's brought down Assyria. He's brought down Egypt, ancient Egypt. He has strengthened us in the Lord. And this verse 12 is a wonderful promise. So I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk up and down in his name, says the Lord. That's kind of interesting. So it's the Lord who's speaking, says the Lord, and the Lord is saying in his name, says the Lord. The Lord says, I will strengthen them in the Lord. I didn't say, I will strengthen them in my power. They will walk up and down in my name, says the Lord. But here is the Lord talking about the Lord. Here is the Lord talking about his name. 
We have the Father referring to Yeshua. So I will strengthen them in Yeshua, and they shall walk up and down in Yeshua's name, says the Lord of hosts, says the Lord God Almighty. He strengthens us in him. Again, not in our own name, not in our own power, not in our own goodness, not in our own character, not in our own abilities, but in his name we have strength. In his authority we have power. In him we ride victoriously. In him we have a strong cornerstone. In him we have the ten pegs holding us firm. In him we have a bow to go through and fight against the devil. In him we have the strength to win on and to march on and to endure to the end. In him, in his name, in his authority, in his power. And so in a moment when we pray, If you've never experienced the first rain, if you've never experienced the first love experience with the Lord, oh, you might have been reading the Bible for a long time, you might know all the stories or a bunch of stories, you might have heard lots of sermons, but if you've never surrendered and never received the peace of God, never received the joy of having your sins forgiven, never received an outpouring of love for God, you're willing to do anything for him. Never received a, a love for people, for other people, to be able to forgive them, to be, care about them, to want them to be in heaven, to want them to be in heaven more than you want to be in heaven. If you've never experienced that first love, then the moment when we pray, ask God to pour out his early rain on you, to pour out his spirit upon you, it's only by his power that we even receive that. It's the early rain and latter rain, that's justification and sanctification, the two parts working together. If you've never experienced that first love, that forgiveness of sins, then a moment when we pray, invite the Lord into your heart. Confess your sins to him. Acknowledge your weakness without him. And ask him to give you his love. Secondly, if you have experienced that, but you've been just coasting along, maybe at a consistent pace, maybe backsliding now, or maybe just plateauing and just kind of coasting along, and you sense the need for that latter rain power to come upon you, to boost you and to get you going again, to get you on fire again, to get you witnessing again, to give you that purpose again. To love reading his word again. To cherish it. You can't wait to spend time with it. To love his law. Then a moment when we pray, ask God to pour out his latter rain upon you. Third, if you've been walking with the Lord and in the strength of the Lord, but you realize all of us are asleep, like the ten virgins, we're all asleep. And you want that extra oil in your lamp. You want to have that power of God to see you through to the end, to endure to the end, to shine for him as stars in the firmament. Then a moment we pray, pray for the latter rain. Ask the Lord for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. For if there's some sin in your life, maybe just one area, maybe just one thing, and you've struggled with it for a while and you haven't gained the victory over it, you've shelved it for a while, you've ignored it for a while, some area, some area you know is wrong and you're doing it anyway, or some area you know you should be doing and you're not doing it, you need that extra power of God's Spirit to give you victory. The moment when we pray, ask for God to give you his Holy Spirit, to give you victory over that sin. Confess it, accept Yeshua's forgiveness, accept his death in, in your behalf, accept his removal of it, and accept the power of the Holy Spirit to change you in that area of your life. 
If you're going through some sea of affliction right now, some storm is in your life, and you need him to be your cornerstone, to be your firm foundation. Your legs are weak. You're shaky and you're trembling and you're fearful. You don't know where you're going. Like a sheep without a shepherd, you lost direction. You don't know what's next and you're afraid. Claim his foundation. Claim his strength. Claim his tent peg to hold you up, to see you through. If you're in the midst of a battle, you need weapons, you need a bow, you need an arrow, you need a, sh a sword, you need a shield, you need a helmet, ask the Lord to clothe you in his armor, to strengthen you in his power, and to go forth as a, as a horse not afraid of the battle, charging into the battle, charging into the fire, charging against the weapons, and not stopping. We need his grace. Ask for his spirit to come upon you and to empower you to go forward in his awesome, mighty, everlasting, victorious right arm. Maybe there's some other area that applies to you tonight. The moment when we pray, ask God to move upon you to work upon your heart and mind, and to give you the full victory in him. Let us pray together. Our Lord and our God, ruler of the universe, we praise your name for your spirit. We praise you for drawing us to you. You promised if you be lifted up, you would draw all people to you. Thank you for drawing us to you. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for dying for us, Yeshua. Thank you for drawing us onto yourself. Thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. Thank you for fulfilling your promises in, in the past and giving us the assurance of the promises in our present and our future. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the promise of the latter rain. Lord, pour out your latter rain upon us. Ripen us perfect us, live in us and through us, and win people for your kingdom out of us. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.